Jacinto was born in Porto in 1974 and now lives in Lisbon. He is a writer, playwright, director, musician, and soccer aficionado. His latest novel, The True Actor, won the 2013 Distinguished Literature Award of the DST, which is the Domingos da Silva Tassiera organization. Yes. For the best book published in Portugal in the past two years, Pires won the prestigious Premio Europa David Morao Ferreira, which is offered duly from Better University in Italy and the Instituto Camores in Portugal in 2008. He plays with the band Os Caix, and his soccer column appears in Journal de Noticias. Several translations of his short prose re uh, recently appeared in an issue of the St. Petersburg Review, translated by Jamie Baraj and Dean Thomas Ellis. Please welcome Jacinto Lucas Perez. Hi. Thank you, Jared. Uh, this is a, I'm reading for this, uh, uh, from this book the, called the, the True Actor that uh, Zank Books just published here. And um, I want to thank, I want to thank uh, Jeff Parker, uh, and he was the, the editor, and uh, Jaime Braz and Dean Thomas Ellis that translated, wonderfully translated this, this uh, crazy thing that I wrote in Portuguese. <laughs> So let's see how it goes. Uh, this is chapter number four. It's called Chocolate and Cookies. Américo puts aside with an inexplicable sense of shame The Explective by Eduardo Fontes, a quite curious and clever book, completely worthy of the countless literary awards it has received abroad, and as the glowing reviews in Portugal's two major newspapers attest, an indisputably ingenious work of great profundity and supreme linguistic invention, and a highly efficient deconstruction of the artificial demarcation between the banal and the philosophical, the philosophical and the banal. This is all his fault, of course. He has neither the patience for profundity nor the head for invention. He just needs a few laughs. He plops the tome onto the shelf of postponed reds and grabs the first one off the next pile, The Flower of Life by Julio Abilio Pereirinha. This novel from another renowned Portuguese author received high praise from the very newspapers, magazines, and critics that so adored Fontes' work. The Flower of Life, they said, was very, very good, magnificent, searing, touched with genius, and a must read. Américo tries not to think too much about this and opens the book before Joaquim awakens. Otherwise, you'll have no time to read any literature at all, good, bad, or indifferent. There's a pretentious inscription on the first page. I dedicate this book to all hearts of stone. And the first paragraph is a bit slow, stuffed with adverbs. But after that, the story <laughs> picks up some steam. A woman in a rolled-up skirt washes clothes in a tub on an obscenely hot day, and only two paragraphs later, a young girl reads a classic of erotic French poetry while hiding from the sanctimonious village shrews, what some people won't do to avoid a day's labor. Half an hour later, a medic who gives in himself, he shuts the flower of life and imagines his false stuff his project for a refined and demanding, yet light-hearted theater that will reach the common folk. The lights come up. Falstaff is dressed as a firefighter. On the back of his uniform, Falstaff is written, just like on a football jersey, and below that, volunteer fireman. He's a fat man, pillows under his clothes, with a, fac a fake red nose, it looks like a potato. He enters the firehouse, sits down on the first chair he sees. He adopts the attitude of someone who's been there a long time and is sick and tired of waiting. A medic who can relate. He too is sick and tired of waiting around and doing nothing. He lies down on the couch, closes his eyes. He has a fiercely strange dream. He's sitting at a table in a restaurant waiting. The other tables, dozens, hundreds of them, all square and covered with white tablecloths, are empty. There's not a waiter in sight. And yet he senses that he's being spied on, perhaps by one of those surveillance cameras hidden behind smoked glass. He plays it cool, looks around. 
It's an old and ample room. A huge chandelier dangles in the middle, like some notion out of the past. Suddenly, from a darkened space he hadn't yet noticed, a red curtain opens and a group of women masquerading as mothers, baggy dresses, breast pumps fastened to their chests, begin dancing a hybrid, a clumsy cancan mixed with a botched burlesque or who knows what. When they make a full turn, America notices some cylinders, like divers' tanks but made of transparent glass, attached to their backs, filled with a white semi-viscous liquid that may or may not be milk. He is far away, seated at a remove from them in his own corner, facing an empty plate, and he has the sensation that they are unaware of his presence. Suddenly, an arm appears and puts a glass of tomato juice on his table. When he turns, the waiter has already vanished. Americ wants to tell him that he hasn't ordered anything, that there's been some mistake, but the man doesn't return. The chandelier sways imperceptibly in the middle of the room. Americo raises the glass to his lips, a familiar flavor, he knows it well, neither tomato nor milk. He looks toward the women and feels adult, sated. The two words appear to him in the dream, adult, sated. How great that he can come to a restaurant by himself, free the master of his own time. Conscious of the significance of this luxury, he leans back on his chair, smiling. He is content, arms resting on the white tablecloth, now incandescent, savoring everything around him. The dance routine of the mock mothers, the cancan of the milk squirting breasts. And it is at this moment it comes to him, blood. It, it's blood he's been drinking. My God, blood. He puts down the glass and stands up to leave. This is unacceptable. You have no right. The dance stops. The women all look at him. They are naked now and very beautiful. Yet it is not desire that America feels. On the contrary, there is now on the faces of the women a deep, prosaic melancholy, a puniness, an expression of a boundless evil. He hears a terrible scream. America runs away in a panic and impossibly traverses the wall into the street. Hundreds of orange buzzes whiz past him. He's on the outskirts of town, on foot, on a highway he doesn't recognize. Pieces of metal lie strewn along the shoulder. A few meters ahead, a double-decker bus is turned upside down, cut in half. A human body, neither male nor female, hangs from some twisted shards of iron. All is quiet. Americo doesn't want to look, yet he is compelled to look when his son awakens, screaming, <coughs> coming. The kid doesn't stop. Christ, I'm, I'm coming already. Joaquin keeps yelling and Americo gets up. In an attempt to calm him down, he carries the boy into the living room, sits him on his lap and turns the television onto the soccer channel. Liechtenstein is playing Malta, a friendly in preparation for a World Cup qualifier. It ends in a scoreless tie 94 minutes later. Joana arrives late in the afternoon, exhausted, but babbling on endlessly about topics that later America will do his best to forget. Circular monologues about the surreal issues that we face concerning the implementation of a plan to regulate the quality of olive oil in this country. <laughs> After managing with great difficulty to put Joaquin to bed, they dine on some frozen pre-cooked things, meatballs and a mysterious green cube described on the package as vegetable concentrate. They watch a game show on TV, after which Juana spends about half an hour on the computer doing some work, while America puts the dirty dishes in the dishwasher. This is the core he hates more than any on earth. Handling those plates caked with mashed potatoes and gravy, with scraps of meat or fish or vegetables, with tiny bites of un un unrecognizable organic matter, the remains of meat or fish or vegetables that look like they've been chewed up and vomited onto the plate in tiny pieces to tolerate the stench, all those horrid odors mixed up with his own in that stuffy kitchen, all of, all of it reminds him only of disease and dissipation and death. Yes, dirty dishes upset him profoundly. The scraps of food on the piled up plates always make him think of his sick and crippled father in the Happy Rest nursing home over in Sintra. If you travel on IC19, you can see the huge billboard on the right showing two smiling seniors and the words Happy Rest 
as though written by hand, a, a giant hand capable of crushing an automobile. <laughs> then you turn off at the next exit, go around the traffic circle, follow the sign that reads health unit, and there you are. 50 meters farther and you arrive at the gate. Americo's father is the white-haired man seated next to the table where they play gin, rummy, and spades. He's been in a wheelchair for four years now. One Wednesday, he suffered an accident while carrying home a TV set, a brand new plasma flat screen Haiku Flash 3.0 with two remotes included. He slipped on the steps in the shopping mall on his way to the car park elevator. It didn't seem very serious at first, but after a while it left him unable to move. And finally, he began to experience personality shifts. He would shout random insults at perfect strangers, laugh and cry unprompted, and with his eyes fixed on some irrelevant detail, a, a stain on the wall, a fly, some dust on St. Anthony's head in the living room, spend hours without saying a word. He had once been a professor of cultural anthropology, which is probably why his preferred epithet in the months following the accident was fucking pygmies. <laughs> he employed the insult indiscriminately, spraying everyone in range with it everywhere, as if the world were, were to blame for his condition. It was a huge relief for everyone when Americo's mother divorced him and the family brought him to the happy rest. Anyway, these are the kinds of things that leave their marks. Every now and then, when Americo is distracted by some soccer commentary on the car radio, passing by signs with funny place names like Chunkville or Girl Market or Tube Town, or, or reading the gigantic letters advertising mini golf, boom, you'll suddenly think of his father. It's kind of a nice sensation, as if someone were stapling his brain with soft little stitches. It, it doesn't hurt so much once you get used to it, but little by little it wears on him, scrapes at old scabs, snatches tiny bits of his soul. Yes, all this stuff comes to him whenever he sticks dirty plates in the dishwasher. His poor old dad. The last time he pays him a visit, he doesn't even recognize him or, or pretends not to. So, Dad, how, how's it going? Cheating at cards again? His father lifts his eyes from the cards, looks at him shamelessly, the serious look of a madman. It puts a scare into him, but uh, Americo uses his actor training not to reveal his feelings. It's something he's never before seen on his father's face, a glazed look of sheer terror. What if his father flies into a capricious rage and attacks him? A grisly scene involving nails and teeth, or skin and blood, or surgical blows against the head and chest hitting all the pressure points? Were his hands all this hairy? But his father only smiles. Professor Orestes, long time no see. Americo tries to smile too. A young nurse with a long face, having seen enough and mortified for him, diverts her eyes. His father crosses his arms. Time hasn't passed for you, Professor Orestes. Americo gasps. I... Should he tell him that this is Americo, his son? His one and only son? Or, or not? Under the pressure of the moment, a swelling silence fills the room. He feels each moment like a violence, a pinprick to the middle of his forehead just above the eyes a needle to his skull that reaches straight through to his thoughts, and he takes the easy way out. He half turns and, and smiles a, a yellow smile. When he is back home in bed, Joanna asks him if everything is all right. Americo says yes. He undresses slowly, puts on the striped pajamas the maid left folded beneath the pillow. She's a tall Moldavian woman, the maid, nice enough but a little intimidating. Her name is Ada. Is that how it's written, he wonders, like a palindrome? Lying down now, the sheets pulled up to his chin, he tries to conjure a little diversion from that afternoon. Ada as a nymphomaniacal nurse. <laughs> it's nothing, really, just something to pass the time before nodding off. He's a kind of wounded war hero lying in a hospital bed, pretending to sleep, but he's actually quite alert and focused, listening to her approach. The sound of high heels on the hypothetical floor. Americo feels a burgeoning contentment. The anticipation builds the imagining. Ada, Ada. But none of this diminishes the fright he gets when her voice whispers in his ear, Come. 
he pivots to embrace her, but the hallucination has already passed. He's suddenly aware that he's not with the masquerading Ada, of course, but with his wife, Joanna, who wants to fulfill her day by showing him how much she loves him and how happy they are, how normal and pretty is this picture postcard of bliss they live within. While they thrash about, and she whispers in his ear some monotonous spiel about visualizing him, visiting her years from now in her workplace and fucking her in the subdirector's office, while her colleagues and supervisors on the either side of the wall stamp reports and papers and other stupid official documents with no clue as to what's going on, he keeps his eyes open and locked on the wall. He repeats yes, yes, oh yes to her slack little fantasy and fixes his gaze at the black line on the white wall, a trivial detail. Just like his father altered after the tumble, his happy, paralyzed, mad father, he gazes at the dark wound and thinks of air pumps, intricate, dirty, noisy machines with cogwheels and pistons churning up and down, up and down, in a monotonous air-pumping fury. Just then she lets go a shriek and he lets himself go, ah, it's all over. My love, she says. My darling, he says. But he's not sleepy. He waits, counts silently to a hundred. He waits a little longer. Joanna's breathing shifts, it's slower, more rhythmic. She's asleep for sure. Americo gets out of bed, puts on his slippers, slides wistfully to the kitchen. He opens the pantry and pulls out the boxes of rice, the packages of pasta, the cans of beans, tomatoes, chickpeas, tuna. He fumbles around in the depths of the cabinet, finds nothing, nothing. He finished, finished the chocolate. How can that be? Not a morsel remains of that chocolate bar he kept stashed there for emergencies like this one. My God, not even a puny little square. He feels a horrible emptiness. He has to eat something to quiet this nameless malaise, something that will directly gratify the pleasure center in his brain. But, but what, goddammit, what? Once, when he was a little kid in a vacation house that his parents had rented in the Algarve, he awoke in the middle of the night and forced himself to walk to the room at the end of the corridor. With a, an inchoate need to experience terror, he opened the door slowly and stepped inside. There was no one there, just a room full of air. He took two steps, stopped. His heart beat rapidly, his hands sweated. He felt a, a weird vertigo, a compression, as if a, a helmet of air he wore on his head had suddenly transformed into stone. But he didn't budge, all part of the game. He stood there, unmoving, speechless, for ten long seconds in the dark. Mixed with his desire to scare himself shitless was the hazy notion to tell it all later to his dad, so that he would know how brave and grown up his son was. But in the end he told no one. He kept it all to himself, perhaps out of pride, who knows. Or maybe it was just that the next morning he let the opportunity pass, and later it didn't seem possible to recount. How pathetic it is telling this story, so brittle, so intimate, now that time has changed everything. In the kitchen now, in the middle of the night, he feels utterly, utterly lost. He needs some comfort food. Something sugary, something sweet, to restore his equilibrium and put a stop to these inner tremors. This is not fear, is feeling, nothing like it, just a little psychological vertigo. He uh, opens the cookie tin and, oh shit, empty. Dear God, totally empty. He was sure there were some left, the ones with the chocolate chips from that package he bought last week. Three or four cookies at the very least. Mother of God, nothing? Americo clutches the round tin, the size of a birthday cake, red on the outside, metallic on the inside, and feels the air stiffening against his eyes and chest. He turns the key in the kitchen door, sits down on a wobbly chair, and remembers when he was little and could summon the fear of vacant rooms. Saudad, that's the word for it. How shameless, a grown man with such namby-pamby notions. When he gets back to the bedroom, he receives quite a fright. What happened? Joanna screams. Nothing, honey, it's all good. I just had to pee. Joanna asks no more questions, and he too remains silent. For half a minute, he stands motionless in the dark, then climbs into bed, sucks in a breath, looks at her face. She seems to have fallen back to sleep, or maybe she hadn't fully awoken, 
and had shouted the words from deep in some dream. Maybe she's dreaming that she's asleep and that someone has crawled into her bed. Yeah, her bed, which is exactly what the medical hates about this house. Everything is hers, the bed, everything, all this useless junk and none of it actually his. Tonight there are no little lights blinking in the ceiling. He turns away from his wife and closes his eyes. Now it's serious, now he will sleep in total silence. As the deaf man says in the final scene of the Chronicle of Pure Rhetoric, the notorious farce attributed to a master scribe in the court of Don Sebastian I, Oh, silence, if you weren't such a shatterbox, the things of this world would more truly speak of its mysteries. Fuck what he wouldn't give for just one of those chocolates made with 70% real cocoa powder. <laughs> <laughs>